I need a new dust filter for my Hoover Max Extract Pressure Pro Model 60. Can you help me with that? A pickup. How hot? Red hot. I know where that is. I'll be there. From here on out, I'm Mr. Low Profile. Just another douchebag with a job and three pairs of dockers. If I'm lucky, a month from now, best case scenario, I'm managing a Cinnabon in Omaha. Some things are inevitable. From the very first shot of Better Call Saul, the audience knows or at least gets a glimpse of the ending of said show and the fate of the protagonist, Jimmy McGill, aka Saul Goodman. There's no escaping his dark and lonely future he creates through his actions in his past, both in Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul. In the current season of Better Call Saul, season 6, the last installment of this masterpiece of a series, there's one episode that paves the dark and twisted road for all of the main characters. This episode is the ninth episode and is called Fun and Games. And today I'll be looking at that episode and the conclusion to some of TV's greatest characters of all time and how their decision, or lack thereof, led them into the abyss that is Breaking Bad. <laughs> As I am recording this, we are still at episode number 9, so maybe in some of the last episodes all of my analysis might get contradicted, but I'm pretty sure that what we see in episode 9 is the last of what we see in this current timeline of Better Call Saul. Spoilers from now on out. After Lalo's and Howard's demise in the last brilliant episodes, I figured we would slowly see all characters become the versions of themselves from Breaking Bad over the remaining episodes, but to my surprise, this one episode manages to move all the characters of Saul, Mike and Gus to their ultimate destination. In the following video essay I want to discuss how and why they end up where they are, how it harkens back to their previous trauma and how the inability to change seals their ultimate fate. Let's start with Gustavo Fring, arguably one of the greatest antagonists of this whole universe who after surviving Lalo, convincing the cartel of his innocence and returning to Albuquerque, now seemingly gets some rest, seemingly having closure after almost dying to the hands of the Salamancas and now enjoying a nice night out at a bar. In the sequence, we soon learn that Gus knows the bartender David who might or might not even be a love interest. Major kudos by the way to the makers of this series to play their cards close to their chest and not revealing what some might have expected in the past. I think it is a very elegant and proper way to still have some kind of mystery surrounding Gustavo's character. David and Gus have a very mundane but warmly conversation and while there is some nice foreshadowing by one of the comments that David makes, this whole chat is very innocent, personal and emotional to Gus, which we haven't seen before in any scene prior. Gus's mantra, sangre por sangre, his lust for revenge after his partner or lover has been killed has vanished for a brief moment of humanity of a man who shields his own with all his power. The foreshadowing, or trigger you might say, is the following line. Do you get that, um, that meaty, it's almost bloody flavor? The soil is all iron oxide and manganese. You can taste it in the glass, right? Sangre por sangre is still present in this room and in Gus's heart. So at the end of the conversation, instead of choosing to pursuing this more personal, more close relationship, he throws his chance away and instead leaves with a facial expression that still hints at the burning revenge in his heart, never to be fully satisfied. 
The tragedy is, he might have had a chance to overcome Max's death, but in this moment, he instead stalls. He doesn't decide to change and goes on a path of revenge that one day will kill him. This inability to change is also reflected in Gus's talk with Mike a few minutes beforehand, where he says the following. For all practical purposes, it's over. When can construction resume? Mike just gives him a look that clearly indicates he knows better than Gus and how Gustavo should stop with this operation. But sadly, Mike is not a stranger to the inability to change. Before I talk about Mike though, I want to close by pointing out the brilliant parallel we see with Gus walking away from his drink and the path he could have had to the scene in Breaking Bad where Walter walks away from his drink and also follows a path of revenge and his ultimate death. Mike's tragic backstory has been discussed over and over again, so I won't go into full detail, but in this episode we see a fitting but sad conclusion to the trauma Mike has suffered. Mike decides to talk to Nacho's father and tells him the truth about his death and assures him his son will be avenged and that the Salamancas will die soon. Manuel Varga rightfully dismisses this thought by claiming that revenge does not lead to anything other than more violence. It never ends. My boy is gone. Mike, while being a fan favorite and maybe even coming off as more innocent in some ways than other criminals in the Breaking Bad universe, is equally as delusional and self-destructive like Gus in his mindset. His guilt over the death of his son and his inability to accept his actions causes his rage and lust for revenge against the cops who did this to his son Maddie to become more and more criminal and crooked. He still has a good heart and a moral code, but he breaks this code because he sees himself as being unworthy of acceptance and love. He thinks his life and his path is already predestined and his choices cannot be reversed. So he stays in this dark place and continues to work with Gus, while also being critical of him. That's why when Nacho's father calls him out on his bullshit, you can see in his face that deep down he knows that he's wrong and he's on a bad path. Also visually indicated by the space on the screen that separates the two men and makes it look like Mike is in a cage. Let's talk about Saul next. I defined Gus, Mike and Saul as main characters at the beginning of the video and while Kim Wexler is of course also one of the main characters of the series, I think she might be the only one out of the bunch, at least for now, to actually change for the better and make morally good decisions again. Saul has also been a victim of trauma, of the lack of love by his brother and his constant suppressing of emotions into criminal actions and social outbursts. And in the scene where Kim breaks up with him, this becomes clear. Instead of admitting to their wrongdoings, Saul blames Lalo Salamanca for what happened. No, Kim, you're wrong. This is about Howard. Okay, what happened to him wasn't on us. It wasn't your fault. It wasn't my fault. It was that fucking Lalo Salamanca. That psychopath came back from the dead and he walked through that door. He did this, not us, him. Instead of actual self-reflection and admitting to his failure and evil behavior, he asks Kim to tell him how to change instead of himself coming up with the change needed to better his life and character. Tell me what I need to do to change, okay? Just tell me what it is and I'll do it. Saul is immutable at this point because he has been shamed and ridiculed by his brother and his life circumstances over and over again, which tragically also pushed him further and further away from the Jimmy we know from season one. The nail in the coffin of Jimmy McGill is this comment by Kim. 
But we are bad for everyone around us. Other people suffer because of us. Which is a direct repeat of a sentence Chuck said to Jimmy before his suicide. You're just gonna keep hurting people. That's not true. Jimmy, this is what you do. You hurt people over and over and over. And then there's this show of remorse. In this moment, Kim agrees with Chuck about Jimmy, unknowns to her, and finally breaks Jimmy, which then with a cut leads to the birth of the Saul Goodman we know. All of the main characters of Better Call Saul are in a loop of their own self-destruction, which they could escape by truly turning their life around and changing their behaviors. Gus could let go of the need to kill the cartel and of his lust for revenge, but chooses the violence instead and denies himself a fulfilling personal life. Mike could retire, but feels the need to punish himself and accept his darker past as his present and future, stopping him from overcoming his son's death. Jimmy was always haunted by his inability to please his brother Chuck, which led him to make morally questionable choices in life and therefore losing even more respect by Chuck. If he let go of his need of attention and love and focused instead of self-reflecting and accepting his strengths as a person, he could have become a well-respected and good lawyer, if that would have been even necessary if he let go of Chuck's grip on his life. Instead, he becomes Saul Goodman, a cynical caricature and all of his worst impulses combined into one person to cope with all of the losses he has had. Chuck, Howard and now Kim. The biggest question that Better Call Saul asks is, how do people become the worst version of themselves? And episode 9 perfectly answers this by saying they could have had great opportunities and a great life and a morally correct and good lifestyle if they self-reflected and changed. Together. We're poison. No, no, just tell me what I need to do to change, okay? Just tell me what it is and I'll do it. 